Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure being here. Back home, where our School of Economics started back in 1871 with uh, Greg Karl Menger. Uh, the main thesis of my presentation here will be about how fractional reserve banking always leads to the unsustainable booms that lead to inevitable busts within the framework of the Austrian business cycle theory. So ironically, there's a picture of the US Federal Reserve. So let us get started by going straight to the thesis that I just told you about. I will jump to the conclusion that explains it, okay? So the mere fact that the Austrian business cycle theory can explain both theoretically and empirically the occurrence of business cycles, this denotes empirically how the, the issuance of fiduciary media, which as Mrs. describes clearly, are unbacked by reserves, this sets in motion an unsustainable bank credit expansion that ends up sowing the seeds of the subsequent bust, okay? So this is highly relevant because Austrian business cycle theory can explain business cycles with and even without the presence of a central bank that allows fractional reserve commercial banks to inflate in unison, okay? Why is this so highly relevant? Well, because critics of Austrian economics often overlook the fact that ABCT explains business cycles even without a central bank. And as empirical evidence of that, we have the great Murray Rothbard and his book entitled The Panic of 1819. Well, this boom boost cycle was one of the many that occurred throughout the 19th century in the United States, okay? And that was even before the, the Federal Reserve was first established as a central bank uh, back in 1913. So there's empirical evidence uh, backing it up. So having stated in the thesis and the conclusion explaining it, uh, let us now, you know, dig even uh, further into this by first taking a look at the Misession approach on fiduciary media, which he describes in further detail in his first uh, masterpiece, which is entitled, when correctly translated from the original German, The Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media. Okay, here Mises elaborates on how fiduciary media are unbacked by 100% reserves, just like I was anticipating, because they are issued over and above the stock of real commodity currency, namely gold, okay? So this leads him to elaborate on his circulation credit theory of the trade cycle, as he originally called it, and which we widely know today as Austrian business cycle theory. And there he shows how um, both um, deposits in the vaults of commercial banks and money outstanding that people carry in their pockets, they're both actually present goods, okay? So since there's no future goods involved here, there's no credit transaction whatsoever because by definition, a credit transaction necessarily involves an exchange of a present for a future good, okay? So this is the, his main point here, okay? So the main consequence of this is the manipulation of time preferences by artificially lowering them below their natural level. Their natural level is the one reflected by time preferences. That is to say, the extent and degree to which we prefer present goods over future goods. When interest rates are artificially lowered through the issuance of fiduciary media, what happens then? Nominal interest rates go down to a level below what is actually reflected by actual time preferences which remain unchanged. And the cyclical consequences of this are that this misleads entrepreneurs into engaging in long-term investment projects, more time consuming, and at some point along the way, interest rates should back up, inevitably pushed up by actual time preferences. And at this point along the way, this unveils the fact that such investment projects that appear to be profitable cannot be carried on all the way through completion. And why did they appear to be profitable at first? Well, because the lower the artificially manipulated interest rates, the higher the profitability benchmarks, such as the MPV, net present value, so such projects appear to be more profitable the more time-consuming they are. 
But when this happens and interest rates shoot back up to their actual level, reflected by time preferences, it is pretty clear that such malinvestment must be liquidated before completion. That is what uh, many authors describe as a cluster of errors. Well, they're not actually errors. There's, the, the, there's a misleading signal that actually pushed such entrepreneurs to believe that such projects would be more profitable than they actually could be. Okay. So those are the main cyclical effects of this manipulation of interest rates, which is what we usually know as Austrian business cycle theory. So this leads us to the enlightening debate between Rothbard and his proposal for 100% reserve banking and his followers versus free bankers advocating for fractional reserve banking. Okay, so Rothbard described this very clearly in another one of his masterpieces entitled The Mystery of Banking. Here, the main thing is that free bankers appear to neglect the Misession framework on fiduciary media that I just described in detail. Why? Because they don't seem to acknowledge the fact that deposits are not actually loans, they're not credit transactions. Why? Because whenever we deposit money at uh, on-demand accounts, such as saving accounts, for instance, we're not withdrawing our legitimate uh, right to redeem such money on demand. Okay, I'm pretty sure we all carry around debit cards. Okay, whenever we pay for goods and services, we use money linked to the accounts in the, uh, for which we use those debit cards, which clearly shows that that money for us is not a future good, it's a present good. We can use it on a 24-7 basis. Okay, so this leads us to deduce how fractional reserve banking ends up causing a maturity mismatching. Why? Because on the one hand, bank assets, mostly loans, are only uh, meant to become liquid, as to say, turn into actual money after a certain period of time, depending on the maturity of the loans. However, bank liabilities, which are mostly uh, on-demand deposits, those are meant to become liquid, that's, that's to say, those are redeemable on a 24-7 basis, on-demand. We have money in our checking accounts, saving accounts, we can withdraw that money from the ATMs and anywhere on a 24-7 basis at any point in time. So there's a mismatching there, okay? This unveils an unsustainable um, structure in banks that exposes them to, to the risk of continuous bank runs, okay? Because there's a risk if the, uh, the percentage of people, of customers that aim to withdraw their money by using the, the legitimate right to do so is higher than the minimum reserve ratio that the banks are forced to keep that will, will definitely and clearly expose this accounting insolvency, okay, as you can see right there. And the ultimate cause of such risk of accounting insolvency is no other than precisely the on-demand redeemability of this, you know, fiduciary media, which are money substitutes, as Mrs. clearly describes it, and therefore they're present, not future goods. This leads to all inconsistencies derived from fraction of the sub banking, okay. So, this is about banking. On the monetary side, I also wanted to touch upon the inconsistencies in the Hayekian monetary, monetary proposal for competing private currencies. You know, as you may know already, the Hayekian proposal is described in further detail in his book entitled The Nationalization of Money, The Argument Refined, in even further detail. However, Rothbard, wisely points out the Hayekian inconsistency in a very short and interesting book entitled A Genuine Gold Dollar versus the Federal Reserve. Okay, he points out that the inconsistency in the Hayekian proposal stems from the fact that just like I was explaining to you before that free bankers appear to neglect the Misession framework on fiduciary media, okay, Hayek goes even further and appears to neglect the Misession money regression theorem why? Because these competing private currencies would lack the defining feature of money, which is general acceptance. As you know, we Austrians define money as a generally accepted medium of exchange. Okay, so these private currencies would still be fiat currencies. That is to say, they would not, when using the Mrs. Regression Theorem, 
when tracking them back in time, you wouldn't have you wouldn't get to a point at which uh, the they were defined as a weight in terms of a commodity currency, that is to say gold. So people would still prefer to keep using uh, US dollars, British pounds, and the like, because when tracking them back in time through the Misession Regression Theorem, you would get to a point at which they were defined and linked to gold. The US dollar used to be defined originally as roughly one twentieth of a troy ounce of gold, the British pound as one fourth of a troy ounce of gold, and so on. For instance, if I issued my own private currency, let's say the Louis, and even if I claim that I have um, my own private ball containing a thousand uh, troy ounces of gold backing up each and every single unit of, let's say, a thousand Louises, you still wouldn't use my currency because it would pretty much have no history of having ever been used as a medium of exchange. That is what Wolfgang points out, that even the removal of the legal tender privilege would not work for the new names would not have emerged out of useful commodities on the free market, as the regression theorem demonstrates they must. Issuance and acceptance are two very different matters. These names will not be chosen as currencies precisely because they have not been used as money or for any other purpose before. Which leads that to our conclusions. Something that Robert Killing explains in another of his masterpieces entitled What has government done to our money? That empirically speaking, the Robertian proposal for 100% resolved banking would imply a pure free market framework applied to the field of money on banking. Okay, that would free us from the constraints of uh, a central bank acting as lender of last resort, which, has, as I said before, will allow commercial banks to inflate in unison, leading to a maturity mismatching, and therefore the business cycle. Okay, so to conclude, I would quote Rothbard again that how fractional reserve banking, he explains, is both inherently inflationary because of the operations of fiduciary media and also fraudulent because it would not let bank customers redeem legitimately all the money from their um, on-demand accounts. He clearly says that the issue of pseudo receipts, namely fiduciary media, like counterfeiting of coin, is an example of inflation. Fractional reserve banks, therefore, are inherently inflationary institutions. If fraud is to be prescribed in a free society, then fractional reserve banking would definitely have to meet the same fate. And that is my conclusion. Thank you. Okay, we have enough time to questions. So, who wants to ask? Uh, thank you. I'm not sure about the claim about the statement about the Hayek in his denunciation of money. I think he wrote that in the first period, when the whole scheme is introduced, the, that paper money can be somehow linked to commodities. And he said that in the later periods, it's no longer necessary to have this connection. So I'm not sure whether this really is at odds with the Misesian regress theorem since Hayek might have ex accepted the fact that in the first place paper money should be linked to commodities. Yeah, the, the thing is that it would imply some, some kind of pyramiding on top of previously issued fiat currencies because, for instance, if you created a, a, lots of private currencies, okay, how would you would have to trace them back to a commodity like the, the, the Misesian Variation Theorem describes, but how would you possibly do that if they're not originally defined as such? That is my point here. Because you can issue your own private currency, but issuance and acceptance, they don't come along necessarily. For there to be acceptance, the, the link to the commodity would not have to be established like um, discretionarily. It would have to emerge out of the free market as happened with the US dollars, British pounds, and the like. That is my point here. Another question? I have one. If it's, if it's possible to, if it's possible to uh, put the cryptocurrencies in your scheme? Uh, honestly, I wouldn't think so, because uh, even though they're redeemable in US dollars, 
I don't think there's a real backing there because you're basically pyramiding a cryptocurrency on top of an already fiat currency. It's, it's the US dollar, for instance, that has the link to go remotely, but still a link, but not the cryptocurrency. If it disappears, if the virtual wallet is gone, or if it's merely a scam, it disappears and it's gone. It's that just as much as if you never had any kind of property on that. That's my point. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, thank you, Luis. Thank you.